listening to You Would Think, the Philadelphia Flyers podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Collington. Joining me today, you already know, it's Mr. Kevin Durso. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Usually I drag that out a little bit, but we got a lot to get to, so we just got to get snappy here. Uh, there's yeah. been a lot going on since our last show. Uh, the, N- the NHL draft has happened. We'll talk about who the Flyers took in the NHL draft. The NHL free agency has happened. We will talk. Well, it has begun. Uh, we'll talk about uh, who the Flyers did or did not sign, didn't go after, trade rumors. We'll talk about all that coming up. Uh, but I did have a little quick show note here right off the top. Uh, I've mentioned it at the end of the last couple of shows, but I'm going to do it right off the top in case you, you didn't listen to that. Uh, at this point, we are firmly in the offseason. And barring news, uh, we will be moving to every other week. Uh, we did it uh, during the summer, kind of during the, the lockdown quarantine period. And we will be going back to every other week just because there's really not a ton to talk about. Uh, that being said, we do have a lot to talk about today. Uh, and we will come back if the Flyers do something huge, right? So you mm-hmm. won't see our show for two more weeks. But if the Flyers go out in two days and trade for Patrick Laine, <laughs> we'll be back next week to talk about it. Don't you worry. Let's, let's put it this way. Depending on what, what the level of the news is, you know, if they re- – like. When they re-signed Phil Myers, I don't think we're planning a new show next week because they re-signed Phil Myers and we all expect it to happen. Now that's, but that's that be- a tweet. But, but that being said, like the point being, if they do something significant, then yes, we will pop on with a new show. But like, and, and I was going to I guess where I was, well, and I, I guess where I was going with that is, is that par for the course, we'll find out something happened on Monday, the day that we, I, I fully expect the Flyers to make a giant trade at about 1 p.m., about two hours after we record this show. But either maybe, way, maybe that's it. Well, if that happens, then we're just coming back on and we're adding to the show yeah, you're instead right. of uh, <laughs> waiting until two weeks from then or trying to set one up for next week. But uh, it's the Monday news drop. It's always the Monday news drop because we always. got it again this week. Uh, yep. And uh, that news was go for it. <laughs> Stunning news. Quite honestly, it was Matt hey, yeah. announcing his retirement and like bad news for the current Philadelphia Flyers roster. Obviously, Absolutely. we wish Matt Niskan in the best. And I, I don't know about you. I firmly believe the man has earned it. The man oh, has he earned has. the right no, to he's walk earned, away. He's earned it. Yeah, he's, he's earned the right. so many miles on his body at such a high level. Uh, multiple time Stanley Cup champion. Uh, Matt Niskanen is going out the right way. And he yeah. deserves it. And he retires. And that's great. But the problem is it leaves a giant hole in the top pair. For sure. And we'll get into that more as we go on. Let's start with the – let's just start with the decision first yeah. and foremost. And I think that – to me, it, it I and I fully believe it. Like I'm not saying it has anything to do with his own health, but I told I you guys in the group chat when when this came out, I said this is 1,000 percent a COVID related decision in the sense that when you just came out of two months in a bubble, and the way that it had to go down, and you've won a Stanley Cup already, and you're 33 years old, and you have kids. I was gonna say he and, has kids, correct? Yeah, he has two kids, and that's where you are in life, and you've done the thing that you set out to do when you play this game and he's done this for 13 years anyway you start to think maybe this is the end of the line i think that in any other circumstance he's saying you know what another year in philly sounds I great come back and play with i've got a shot again maybe yeah. we'll do you know do something special with this group i don't think we have to change much but as soon as it came into the two things are it's how are they going to do this and when are they going to do this and if they don't know the answer to either of those questions right now perhaps the easiest thing in his mind to do or the thing that gives him the most peace of mind, I should say, is I've had a good career. I've done this for 13 years. He's 33 years old, which means he's been doing this since he was 20 at the NHL level. Right. I'm hanging him up. Uh-huh. And there's no shame to that. There's no fault in that. It's That's why we say he's earned the right to yep. get to that stage of his career and say, I've done everything I could possibly do, and now I want to focus on family. And I'm sure that down the road, there's a place for him in the game somewhere it may Matt be as soon as a coaching year. job next year if he wants it right like on it's, somebody's it's even, bench um, somebody's minor league system somewhere yeah yeah for sure and i mean, I mean let's this way there's a number make of a great scout yeah probably and the only thing that makes me say no to that right off the bat is that that's also a thing that involves a lot more he travel wants to spend time with his family right so <laughs> i i think that the and not to say that you know player development or anything like that doesn't require some form of travel especially if you're going to work with kids you know, prospects that are coming up through the ranks because they're all over the place. But you can but work I, from I, home. I, well, I, well, I think you can control your schedule a lot more than scouting because scouting is, is basically a what play not only because scouting isn't just following up on the ones that are in your own organization. It's also a go Let's watch this game talent. and scout this kid yep. who we think we might be interested in down the road because he's getting first round buzz for the next draft. And that's yeah. happening in November and December. 
even yeah. if the draft isn't until June typically. or October <laughs> or October. Yeah. Then <laughs> I'll get into that in a minute because yeah. man, this draft was something else. Yeah. But I did want to say one more, one more quick thing about yeah. Matt Niskanen. Um, I'm going to say the same thing about Matt Niskanen that I said about Tuka Rask deciding to leave the Boston Bruins and going home to spend time with his family. Right. It's a game. Yep. It's not, it does not in any way, shape or form supersede family. Matt Niskanen think- has made enough money. He never has to touch a hockey, a hockey stick again. So let so him go be so with his he- family. Let him go be a dad. Let him go. If he doesn't want to come back and coach. Cool. Let him go. Well, sure, enjoy yeah. being a dad. He's earned it. And I think that the, the life after hockey thing, when they stop playing the game and go and do something else, anything else involves more of the work-life balance that they need at that stage of life where it Absolutely. is I've been away. Like, I don't think that you're picking anything to do, scouting, coaching, whatever it is. If you don't, at the very least, factor in what it's going to be like. I mean, I think the only, to me, the only job that you would be able to take that would require as much work as being a player is if you're the head coach or assistant coach at the NHL or minor league level. Right. Well, and, and I've heard from several players, mostly via spit and chicklets, that after you retire, a lot of times uh, a player's wife will go to them and say, hey, I just spent the last several years taking care of the kids. I'm going to go do my own thing. And you get to be the dad for a while. Yep. And you get to be a main home figure. And for a lot of these guys, that's all they want. And Matt Niskanen, I imagine, is probably in that same boat where he just wants to spend a ton of time with his kids. You, and that, I, you and get again, that can't sense. be that. And I, I believe that at some point in time, after all, after the news settled in, and obviously after everybody kind of had their reactions to it, being that, look, you're you're without a top pair defense. Well, right. Your first reaction is like is is a little bit of surprise because I don't think we saw it coming, especially like you see and it, it all happened when very it, very quickly. Well, you, well, it didn't, it yeah. didn't, and I'll get into that in a second. Like, it's you're surprised by it, you're reacting to it, and the thing the thing that was probably the most surprising about it is that he's not at the end of a contract. If he was owed a contract. And you knew that you're, you were trying to the resign. Play, well, the player's going to then contemplate whether or not do I even play again? Do I Is test the market? Do I go? Right. right. Do I go somewhere else? Do I stay with the team that I'm currently with because I like it? Do I take less money than I might be able to get because I'm I like the team I'm currently with? Right. That's the way that the free agent game kind of works in that sense. But Matt Niskanen kind of had a job. He had one more year. Right. Left. And he had one more year left. So I think we all just assumed he's going to, you know, we, I think we literally actually, and, we're going to talk about this later on the show. We had it, we had it penned in top pair next year. Pro Rob Well, not only did we have it, it, well, not only did we have it like that, but it's a phrase that I'm going to use later in the show anyway, because it's probably, I'd say more true than not how this off season is going to go now, but we literally used the phrase last week, run it back. Run it back. You could run it back the way that it was just about. And, and And you'd be just fine. Right, and that was assuming Carter Hart's another was year part older, of it. Carter Hart, is another year on there. Older. and now it's changed dramatically. I mean, for that one particular spot, anyway. I mean, I don't think that there's a lot of other areas that you sit there and you go, okay, there's an issue now. Well, like we're going to talk about guys who signed elsewhere. That's you know to tease free agency talk a little bit. Yeah, yeah we're gonna. <laughs> we sure and, are. But nonetheless, like I feel like. There's not a single position that I look at up front where I go they're worse than they were per se. Like it, it either evens itself out or it's you're going to take a chance on somebody like doing going through the philosophy that you talked about all along, which is taking out somebody who wasn't in the organization originally and letting somebody who was from draft day or signing them from European leagues or whatever take get get that opportunity. Yeah, and, and producer Mike mentioned it in the group chat, and I, I I kind of agree with him on some level. The only big loss up front is Tyler Pitlick, really. You know, right. I, I don't I don't see Nate Thompson as a huge loss. He signed somewhere else. No, no, no. And we well, here's the thing: we Tyler Pitlick was a contributor. Those. Well, and we dismissed certain guys anyway. We already kind of had it in the back of our minds. Nate Thompson, Derek Nate Thompson Grant. wasn't coming back. Right. Derek Grant Thompson, probably Derek Grant. wasn't coming back. Right. More than likely, it was not going to happen. Right. And Tyler, Tyler Pitlick, Pitlick, I was really the thought he would have. They yeah. would have they would have clung on to him, but it turns out he got paid. And well, and here's here's the thing. Yes, he did to an extent. Like I don't think that that contract is <laughs> outraged that they couldn't have done it. I think the game changed the day that they knew Niskanen wasn't coming back for sure. Yeah, and like, even our and even our group text changed dramatically. It went right, from like, "Hey, we're good. This is going to be a nice, fun draft. Maybe we pick up a little piece here or there." To, "Oh, we need a defenseman." 
and everything well, kind of flipped. It changed free agency, I think. Like the yes. draft, it didn't as much because the draft, it was kind of you, you knew. And I, I kind of get the sense that you know, because for everybody who's going to sit there and talk about, and we'll talk about specifics with these picks, but everybody who sits there and says they have to work on something this year in particular, knowing that we don't know when their seasons start and a lot of stuff is up in the air right now. Yeah, you probably made the pick four years out. Like yeah, you made a pick of even the first round you're making a pick and going four years from now. That might be when I hear about him at the NHL level. Yeah. And that's the thing about the NHL is unless you're getting a guy in the top five, really. Right. You don't necessarily expect a player to jump in right away. I'm going to go out on I'm going to go out on a limb and tell you right now from this year's draft. The only first rounder who's playing whenever they start back up with the NHL is Lafreniere. Man, in in a non covid world. I think Quentin Byfield probably well, has a shot. But that's why I'm saying, I'm saying like, given the state of everything, yes, I think absolutely. that, I I think that one player from this year's draft is playing on opening night of the NHL season. And that's the guy who went first that everybody knew was going first. I think that both Byfield and, and Stutzla had shots. But man, the Rangers, the Rangers really made them sweat. <laughs> like everyone, They always do. I mean, the team who first. first always makes it. But the more Rangers of a show than it is. To, I mean, I, the Rangers refused to commit to him and then made the pick with two seconds on the clock. Man, the Rangers really made him sweat it out. I mean, I, I think when McDavid was picked, Edmonton waited all five minutes too. Like, let's be real about that. Teams that's fair. It's it's TV drama for you. They they well, drown, little, you know. There was a little bit of last minute buzz about them potentially trading the pick. And I heard I Buffalo don't think they and Jack Michael thought and, about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't necessarily know either, but you know, wait. I'm sorry. Are you telling me that everything you read on the internet isn't a hundred percent true? I don't exactly. I don't understand. What are you? Isn't that a shocker? <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's let, shifting back to Niskin for a moment because yeah, I, the one thing I did like is that very quickly the Flyers pivoted to Justin Braun, and I know Justin Braun's not your replacement for Niskin, but to get him at that price, you know, to take two million dollars off the contract, get him for two years, and say this is a guy who is going to be a fixture of the penalty kill and probably play in the bottom pairing or maybe have a borderline top four role is right. not a bad price, especially when you go from freeing up the 5.75 million that Niskanen was going to make. And that just gets freed up. He wasn't over 35. It doesn't become a cap hit. Right. So it's free. And then you save $2 million on Justin Braun per year after you save $500,000 on Brian Elliott. So at that given point in time, before you enter everything, I think that Chuck Fletcher is pulling all of the right strings and, and hitting all the right notes here with the amount of money he's saving. Right. And I'm, and I'm looking at cap friendly right now and sitting here on uh, October 11th at 10, 19 AM with Phil Meyer still unsigned and Nolan Patrick still unsigned. Right. The flyers are sitting at $8.685 million in cap space. Okay. And I, I rounded it down instead of up. Like you could round up to 8.7. I call it 8.6. Uh, yeah. But uh, so we're looking at are Myers and Patrick going to make a combined total of more than $2 million. Two is oh. tough. I think three is where you're at. So let's say three. So the flyers are sitting on between five and a half and $6 million of actual, like actionable cap space. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and and we heard some things about what they might do with that cap space, right? We heard about TJ Brody. Mm -hmm. We heard the Flyers were big in on TJ Brody. Uh, and he ended up not coming here. He he signed in. He signed in Toronto. He signed in Toronto, right? Toronto had a huge day. Yeah, there were we're some gonna... teams that there were some teams that really did have significant days all, all in all. I mean, since we touched on Toronto here, I do want to mention Wayne Simmons. Yeah, Man. that's a good one. I mean, then that was it's, that was kind of freaky. Be, it's going to be really tough for me not to buy a Wayne Simmons St. Patch jersey. Mm. That, that would look cool. Because I don't um, know about you. Like, I, a lot of our long-term listeners know that I am very, very Irish. Now, I, I, I don't, I don't know if you've heard about this or not, because it was kind of a footnote on the on free agent frenzy. Because you're not looking at this particular piece of news; you're just looking for where. But it's going to take me a long time to get used to seeing him wear. I think he's wearing number 24. Oh, oh no. Is, yeah. is 17 a retired number in Toronto? I don't know for certain, um, but I will check for, I will check oh, to man. see who's wearing it currently. Oh, um, because, that is, that is a or if it'll, oh no, that's not the same. Because, <laughs> I know. I, I, I didn't know. 17 is retired. That's Wendell Clark's number. I didn't, oh, I knew Clark it was Wendell Clark's number originally. I didn't know if they'd retired it. That was the key. Right. So that's why 17's taken. Um, but yeah, uh, so that's who I, well, and I believe if he's taking that number, um, 
it was Kasperi Kapanen's number. Wow, he's gone. And, and he's been traded, uh, so that's why. Um, also, since we're talking about Toronto, they also traded Andreas Janssen to the New Jersey Devils. That's an, that Devils was a little also, bit interesting to me. New Jersey Devils also had a great day and a great couple of days in free agency here. And they're, as far as I'm concerned, they're doing a great job of getting themselves set up, right? They're, they're kind of doing that aggressive two, three-year rebuild that the Rangers have kind of done. Watch out for the Devils, man. Maybe not this year. But next year, the year after that, they get a little goaltending. That that Devils team has got some talent, for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, I did also want to mention the first big story of free agency, and we will circle back and get to the draft. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the big story for free agency, at least for me, the first 12 hours or so, was all the goalie movement. Yeah. The, the, well, that was, to me, I think that one of the biggest shifts of of the whole dynamic of free agency this year was without the period leading up to about it, which is what about a week? I think, I think it's, it's usually get a like week. five days. Yeah. Something it's like something that. like that. And without that time frame to actually oh, talk to period. players. And I mean, Wayne Simmons was the exception because Wayne Simmons got permission from Buffalo to go talk to other teams. And, and he that's signed why 1202. literally 1202 yeah. there's deal. And same thing with buyouts because okay. Henrik Lundqvist was bought out and, all, and everybody knew that deal with Washington was happening. Man, Henrik Lundqvist to Washington. Oof. Henrik, what's going to be weirder, Lundqvist in Washington or wearing number 35? No, see, the weirdest part for me is Holt in Vancouver. Well, I, 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 don't remember, <laughs> I think I sent it to you guys and tweeted it at some point in time, but it was funny watching one goalie from one team go to the next team and then fa- finding their former goalie go somewhere and that team's former goalie go. Like, it well, was that's how team. it works. Everybody it had a goaltending vacuum. It was Lundqvist to Washington. Holtby went to Vancouver. Jacob Markstrom went to Calgary. Cam Talbot went to Minnesota. Like it was just this chain. Yep. And I mean, and the only look, we can't piece the other part together because once we get to the Minnesota part of it, where Cam Talbot ended up, Minnesota had traded their we, goalie we earlier trade, in the week. Right. And that was a little bit different. But, and at that point in time, then San Jose didn't lose a goalie. Right. San Jose's got, they just never really had one to begin with because well, Martin, <laughs> whew. Sorry, Martin, Martin Jones. Yeah, sorry, Martin Jones. Jeez. Uh, listen, when um, you're sub 900, you're not an well, NHL yeah, goalie. Well, Get out of here. There's a reason they address that area. Let's be real. That's why that, the Ottawa Senators got the fifth overall pick in the draft. It was, yeah, that's true. That's the reason. It's because San Jose couldn't find goaltending. Yeah. <laughs> they were about to hire the whale from the commercial or the, the, or the seal walrus. from the commercial. The walrus from the commercial. <laughs> like San Jose was getting there, man. Can you stick some skates on them? <laughs> That's pretty good. I, I didn't think about that. But there's, there was a run on goalies because it's the most premium position. It's the, it's the position every team knows they need. So I think everybody how else. Nice, how nice was it that the Flyers weren't throwing did stupid you see me money tweet at Ilya Brzgalov? Yeah, I think I shared it in our group chat, too, that the Flyers didn't have to go out there and sign to be part Jacob Markstrom to six years, six million dollars or whatever he made. Like goalies got paid. Well, too. I think that that start that didn't start from. Markstrom that started from Robin Lehner re-signing at five years five per and, and by and the then, way Vegas has not traded Marc-Andre Fleury yet right I have a feeling the Detroit Red Wings are about to get a whole bunch of assets to take that contract they might but I, I think I've heard some other names that float around I mean there's a lot of different names that float around with Detroit right now Detroit's got money that's the thing they've got Detroit's cap space money so and they Stevie can y, Stevie Y knows how to weaponize cap space yeah, but I think that see, here's the thing about about them to an extent is that they, you know, Eiserman built. We talked about this last week when we were talking about Tampa building that team from within and building that team with with draft picks and prospects. I don't know that Detroit has the the crop just yet. I mean, certainly no. that certainly they did well with their pick in the draft this year. I think that that fourth overall pick is going to look really good. They're still recovering from making the playoffs for 25 years straight, and when you well, make yeah. the playoffs for 25 years straight, you don't have a prospect system. Not really. One, and you know, it's it's because it's also such a league of parity. You think that you can get back into the playoffs pretty easily too, to an extent. I mean, it's hard to get into the playoffs, but it's not as difficult with the number of teams that make it and how many are in and contention. They're, and they're another team that hasn't had goaltending in several years. You know, Jimmy Howard's fine, and Jimmy Howard is okay if he's got a good team in front of him. But right, Jimmy Howard can't prop up any. Well, Jimmy sort Howard's of no longer. Well, Jimmy Howard's no longer with them either, and that's the thing. So right. now that he's no longer, you might change directions and you know, and look to something else. Yep. Uh, sorry, I don't know how we. Oh, I'm gotten- sorry. Wait, 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 they do have a goalie now. We, we did. Did you see this? I don't know. If, I would say I thought they signed somebody. They signed Thomas Grice. Oh, they did sign Thomas Grice. You're right. I'm sorry. I I was the one who texted it to the group chat. Um. 
yeah, that, Thomas Grice. Man, Thomas Grice gets starter money now, so that's the thing. Like that, I, I think I think Thomas Grice owes Barry Trotz a beer. Maybe a steak. He dinner. owes him for he owes him for games four and seven of the Flyer series for making his stock go way up because he had two outstanding games. Yep. And then you know, I mean, I understand. Like, and here's the thing: he gets victimized by the rest of the team's performance in Game One of that Tampa series, and then never saw the net for the rest of it. Yeah, and it's not really his fault. And that's and that's unfortunate. Uh, we did, we, we do have maybe the biggest goalie news that we haven't touched on yet. And that is Matt Murray, Ottawa Senator. Yeah. And, and that, well, the contact, I think the extension's more, the contract extension right. is more so, of a story than the trade itself. Oh yeah. The Cause trade, the trade was for his rights and it was a second and a well, and prospect trade, who was a fourth. Right. But the trade's been talked about for some time. And I'm not talking about specifically to Ottawa, but people have been mentioning Matt Murray being traded for Ireland, and really well, one of them's got to go, right? You can't keep Murray. And well, the Jari. writing was on the wall when, when Tristan Jari signed an extension. He signs for three more years, and all of a sudden now it's Matt Murray's the well, odd man. I guess that's the guy you're sticking to, obviously. And unless you're going to pay Matt Murray for a year at a very low cost, it's kind of like Vegas signing Leonard, right? When Vegas yeah. signs Leonard, you know the writing's on the wall for Flurry. When when no, Pitts, when Pittsburgh signs Jari, Matt Murray's got to go. Ah, hmm. that would be so ironic though if that if both of them who were both, I mean, they were the two for yep. those cup teams. They were the cup. They were the cup winners. Yeah. And now they're both going to be on their way out of well, wherever they were. And, and, you know, I mean, here's the interesting thing. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, Robin Lehner is a good goalie and earned that contract. Certainly. Don't get me wrong. I think that's going to be a great deal for Vegas. I'm just, the thing I'm wondering is, is that possibly still, you know, could that possibly still be the biggest area of weakness that Vegas has? Because they're so good up front. They've got a good defensive core that if uh, Lehner has to play stand on his head sometimes, and if you like, I don't necessarily know the team in front of him is pretty good. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not saying it's all the time, but I'm saying like, does it become because they're so good in front of him? Does it become either on the nights when he has to stand on his head? Is he good enough to do it? And is he going to get suspect to maybe poor, you know, allowing a poor goal here or there because he doesn't see as much action in front of him? Okay. That's fair. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, it's, it's not to take away from his own abilities. It's just the dynamic of being a goalie in Vegas to me sometimes can be a little difficult because there's either nights where you have to be completely a thousand percent on your game because the rest of them are not right. Or, or they are all really on their game and the limited action can make you not as good. You know, like flurry had those games where he was not as good because of the fact that the team in front of him might've been allowing fewer shots and he would just be off of his game and still give up like you'd see nights where he would make 16 saves, give up four goals. Right. You know, well, and they might still win the game. That's the thing. Like they might right. still win the game. That Vegas team is crazy. Uh, but the thing is looking at Robin Leonard, mm -hmm. you, you ask if he's got the ability to stand on his head and steal a game. Oh, I'm not saying I didn't ask if he has the ability. I'm wondering how much they're going to need him to be that guy. And if he's going to be able to be that more consistently. I think the, like, Vegas's team is built better than the Islanders were when Robin Leonard was there. Yeah. And they're built better than the Chicago Blackhawks were when Robin Leonard was there. Well, they're definitely built better than the Chicago Blackhawks. Right. Were there. The Islanders Sh continue to progress. So it's a little different, uh, but sure. And that's a more defensive but he was system never gonna get, and it protects your goalie more. But I don't I think understand. he was ever going to get a full fledged shot as the number one in, in, with the Islanders either. And that's the other thing about it. Like, Guys want to know that they're the guy, and that's right. what like, Robin Lehner signing this deal and, for one and reason, heard, one reason only. And it's because he's getting a five-year commitment at five million dollars per, and we from heard a team some, that already had a goalie. Yeah, we heard some sketchy, sketchy reasoning out of Lou Lamorello last year about why he did or didn't sign Robin Lehner, and you know whatever. But the thing so is, he goes out, no, so he goes out and picks up Semyon Varlamov and gets to the conference final. Right. You know, no big deal, you know. But I. I like when I'm evaluating players at the NHL level, I like to use kind of a three year, you know, what have they done over the last three years? Okay. That's fair and, enough. And for me, Robin Leonard has been pretty freaking good for the last three years. Yeah. So I think that that's the timeline. Right. So I'm looking at, he's come a long way since the Buffalo years. Yes. I can tell you that. And yeah, I know I had him in fantasy the year he was supposed to be the starter. And <laughs> it was bad. Um, don't feel so bad. I had Carter Hutton last year, so. <laughs> hey, me too. Um, <laughs> but either way, like I look at Robin Leonard and over the last three years, he's been one of the better goalies in the league. Like in terms of a consistency basis, like over the last three years, who's been better, more consistently than Robin Leonard has. Right. Well, and see, not I, a ton of guys. To tie this back to the Flyers, Matt Niskanen side of things to an extent too. 
I think we want to see Carter Hart's numbers continue to progress in that range. And I think that we put a lot of stock into the team in front of you. You know, Robin Leonard's numbers look as good as they do, probably because of how well the Islanders play defense and how well Vegas plays defense collectively. And Carter Hart's numbers looked pretty darn good last year because of the fact that they had a pretty solid defensive core in front of them most nights. Right. And that's yeah. where it comes from. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's just one of those things that I don't know. I think Vegas is a really, really good team. Vegas is a really, really good team. Yeah. And and they and quite honestly, who knows if they've got more room to get better. You right. know, like, like they, they are they definitely are exploring options that would make them better. It's just a matter of Yeah, let's just let's just talk about that elephant in the room. Somehow, somehow. They're the lead candidate to get Alex Petrangelo at the moment. Well, it, it and again, we're talking ten thirty on Sunday morning. Well, it would help that you unload a contract like Paul Stastny's to uh, Winnipeg. They for next to pure nothing. Pure dump Paul Stastny's contract for what a fourth round pick, a fifth round pick, something like that. That is a pure cap dump at that point. And they're they're freeing up space. Yeah, there, there's talk about the flurry contract going. They're they're really looking to push that. There was a rumor. Uh, from one of the Bob McKenzie or Elliot Friedman, somebody Mm -hmm. who circulated that they offered the entire league, Mark Andre Fleury and a second round pick for nothing just to get his contract off the books. And the entire (laughs) league passed on that. Wow. Because they know that Vegas has to move it, right? If, if Vegas, Vegas cannot put $13 million into Robin Lehner and Mark Andre Fleury. This, this would be a really good time to shift to, some of the flyers angles with it because yeah. I know that people were not thrilled with the patient approach on set, you know, on Friday and Saturday so far, at least, right. you know, when everything opened up and you have an added near $6 million in cap space that you weren't expecting when that this you weren't expecting. Bails. And, right. and don't get me wrong. I like out of that, I guess you could sit there and say that nearly 2 million of it went to keep Justin Braun, you know, yeah. allocate it however you want to. And yes, you still have to sign Phil Myers and, and Nolan Patrick. And, but again, and we don't expect those to be problems. Nolan well, Patrick we don't, can't even get off sheeted. No, and Nolan Patrick, like, it's nice to hear he's working out near home. I believe That's he played great. in a scrimmage the other played day. Played in a scrimmage. Yeah. That's what they said. And I, I, there's a connection to Ryan White, former flyer, who I think yeah. must be out that way and is helping orchestrate, like, and I believe, players on the ice. And I believe Ryan White is kind of part of that, um, that Dan Carcillo collective of guys who are uh, – supremely concerned about head trauma and head injuries i believe ryan white is is actively involved in that as well i don't so think if, to if, the extent that carcillo is but I, yeah, well, I think you're right. he's certainly not as uh, vocal as dan carcillo is because sure listen dan if you're listening we would love to have you on the podcast uh, <laughs> but I, I believe ryan white is also kind of in that that advocacy role so the fact that he's working with nolan patrick someone who's having concussion related head issues right it is probably a good sign that Ryan White said, Hey, it's cool if you play. You know what I'm saying? Like, if anybody's going to be careful about it, I feel like Ryan White's going to. And not hey, only hey, that, but don't play in this one. I don't think that, I don't think that Chuck Fletcher is going to tell you anything or anybody else in the organization is going to tell you anything because of the fact that they don't want to create a false sense of hope this far out from the season. Well, I think you're going to- for the last year we've been hearing, well, he's getting closer. He's getting closer. He's getting closer. I don't know how much closer he can get. Yeah. But <laughs> see, there's another, there's another layer that for me, you know, cause it, it, yes, it was a whole season thing, but realistically when the pause happened, who knows if he was actually close to coming back then or not. And they just didn't want to bring him back after that, because who wants to tell somebody you have two weeks to prepare for a four week sprint. And you haven't played in a year. Now, the thing that gets to me more is the fact that the longer it drags out, when does the season start? Obviously, I mean, and, and let's throw this little news drop oh, in yeah, here. The, really NHL, quick. the NHL did announce that they're targeting a January, January 1st. 1st. Yeah. Right. So whether it starts then or not, if he's not ready to go in January and it continues, are you supposed to get, no, are you supposed to get to next April and literally say that this kid hasn't played in a, a professional game in two full years it, we're getting to that point like at that point in time if you if you get to two years and you haven't played in a professional game because this is an issue you might want to step away yeah well, right well and, and we were talking a little bit earlier about the forward core and how we can kind of run it back and blah 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 at this point and i hate to say this 
Nolan Patrick returning to play would almost be like a free agent signing or a trade or an, an or acquisition sure at this be. point because we've just looked at this for like this forward core without Nolan Patrick, without Oscar Lindblom for a large chunk of the season. Mm-hmm just made it to the end of the second round, right? You made it to game seven of the second round against right. the very you did, good Islanders. You have, you have to admit that for the two games that Limblom played, you basically just plopped him into your lineup and said, let's do it for a, um, an emotional boost more than right. anything. Like he wasn't there to him contribute. Expecting him to contribute like, well, he and contribute in different ways. I mean, like he contributed on the ice, he contributed obviously. on the, on the, in but the he, bench, it, on the bench you, and in the room. But did you think, yeah, but like, did you go in and think he was going to score, you know, maybe like we did sit there and we did make that, you know, oh, say man, that I w- I in overtime, cried. right? In overtime in game six, we did say that. But I would have sobbed. <laughs> I mean, he- I don't know. What would but yeah, like it, it is like acquisitions at that point in time. And not right. only that, but it's really unfair to hold it against Nolan Patrick. You can sit there and say he yeah. missed, you, you can sit there and say he missed the entire year. And that's fair. This is a problem that caused him to miss the entire season. Right. Last year. And, and I'm saying that because you got to March. What was the likelihood that by you know mid-March with 13 games left that you were really not coming in, right? So you can say he missed all last year, but now you can't hold against him the fact that this timeline gets longer because there's a pandemic. Right. You if you hold he, that against him, that it's not starting, that we're not starting. If the, the world was now. normal and we were three or four games into the season and he was playing, then there's no problem. Or at least we would know, you know, like right. training camp would have been last month. We would have had an idea that okay after sitting out a year you got this in check you've prepared for a full off season you're ready to go now we don't know that and and, and for the record sorry uh, for the yeah, record no, i don't hold this against nolan patrick the person right this right. is obviously it's not his fault it's a head thing he, you know uh, brain injuries are tricky but you have to acknowledge that Nolan Patrick, the asset of the Philadelphia Flyers, the second overall pick a couple of years ago, the, you know, quote unquote, one C, two C of the future that we all Mm kind of had him penciled in as in that sense, it's been disappointing. And again, nothing against him as the person. I'm sure he's doing everything within his power to play. And I'm sure if he could decide he would snap his finger, it would go away and he'd be back to playing. Right. But as an asset, it's pretty disappointing at this point. And it's, and it's tough for him because I, I can tell you right now, this is a player, it, it, from my estimation anyway, from having seen him, that has not really had to deal with adversity through his development. You know, he, let's just say for two years, everybody basically told him, you're going to be the number one overall you're pick. You're the guy, you're the guy, you're the guy. And he yeah. wasn't the number one overall pick. So maybe that was the slight little bit of adversity, but nonetheless, he still made the team and right he, away. He did have that injury in his draft year, and that's kind of part of where some of this – I'm sorry. No, it wasn't an injury. Was he sick? No, I think he had an injury his draft year. And that's why he kind of ended up not being a slam dunk number one, like he was originally supposed to be. But none, I mean, nonetheless, he's yeah. still, you know, like it, when you've been told your entire life, you're the best, you're the best, you're the best. And then you're not the best by any stretch and you it's have to, to work for it really hard. And, and now you can't because something is literally forcing you off the ice. Right. The doctors will not let you. He, right. But I always noticed like from the beginning that his personality is this somewhat quiet confidence. I don't think he speaks out about stuff a lot, but nonetheless, like you hear him talking, it's almost like, I don't want to do this type of thing. Like, I don't want to talk about stuff. I just want to go play. Right. I don't get him. I don't get him as the media guy. Like he's very very hockey player, right? Play a full 60, get pucks in deep. (laughs) And it's, and it's hard to say, because here's the thing, like, you might be that guy for reasons that are like, I just want to play. I'm tired of talking about why I'm not playing. That could be fair. And that's and, totally fair. You know, and, and again, that's the adversity that he hasn't really had to deal with. Here's this thing that's keeping him off the ice. Why is it keeping him off the ice? He doesn't have the answers and he's not, he's not supposed to. Right. And that just increases the frustration level. Yeah, for sure. But it, but it obviously sets in like, here's a guy that you expected to have this big role and he doesn't. Right. And that gets frustrating too, because he, you know, this is a second overall pick. You could have picked anybody else too. You could have let him slip further. Maybe if, if this is more of a known thing at that time, right. You know, maybe who you look third? at somebody Miro else. Heiskanen and then right. Kel McCarr. <laughs> or, the, or Elias three Patterson. And four. <laughs> right. It, it's yeah. And again, it's, and it's, I, it's and not again, his fault. No, well, right. And again, right. you're not picking any of those guys over him at that at time. The time. But if you knew this, 
yeah, you would change your mind. If you knew this and you knew how quickly the others would develop, because all three of them that we just mentioned and that went in the top five after him are playing at the NHL level and playing significant roles at the NHL level for that matter. Like that's how good the call there or that's how good that draft was draft was then. Like, isn't it not only say that they all made it in two years or three years, but that they also are all holding pretty much significant roles. I mean, Nico Heischer is still a top forward for New Jersey, no matter how you want to spin it. And then the other two are, you know, the two defensemen are top pairing defensemen already. And Pedersen has emerged as pretty much one of the top guys in Vancouver because he had to be from the beginning. They didn't have depth. So he jumped into the spot. And then after that took off and he said, okay, he's in the top six. No question about it. Now, now question for you. Mm -hmm. If Nolan Patrick's healthy this year, do the Flyers trade for Derek Grant? I mean, obviously, depends, again, I mean, hindsight on, 2020 and blah, blah, depends blah. On what he's, de- depends on what he's giving them, but probably not. Probably not. So now now you're talking about this guy costing you assets, right? Because you had to spend assets to go out and get their grant. Right. Obviously on a smaller scale. But if you have Nolan Patrick penciled in as, say, a 2C of the future behind Sean Couturier for the next five or six years. Right. You now have to replace that. Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't look, at this point in time, again, Sunday, October 11th, at this point in time, it doesn't look like Nolan Patrick's necessarily going to be that. Right. It, 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 there's a lot of questions involved. And I, I mean, that, that's why people feel the way they do when it comes to the way that free agency has gone to this point. You, you know, if, if someone hands you $6 million in cap space because he retires and you have, even if you have $8.6 million, I guess it's knowing that the hole is there. And here's the thing, like the flyers are going to play this game that a lot of the other teams are playing to, to an extent. I mean, maybe on a lesser scale because the flyers have done virtually nothing free agency wise to this point. And that, and that's why like everybody has, has the feelings they do, but Tampa Bay put Tyler Johnson on waivers because they know they need cap space. And the other 30 teams in the league turned around and went, yeah, no you just like, no, not, not only that, but when you just want a Stanley cup, we're not helping you out, out that easily. Right. Like we're going to put you into a corner where now you have to trade somebody. Yep. And it's you know, funny if because... you want to free up the cap space and you're going to have to make it a really sweet deal. Like it's going to be, I give you my third or fourth round pick for a guy who helped you significantly last year. Yep. And, and it's funny because for years we saw teams help out the Chicago Blackhawks while the Chicago Blackhawks were winning cups in the early half of the 2010s. How often were teams bailing them out by taking bad contracts all the time? And I feel like the league has finally learned their lesson and gone, no, no, no. Tyler Johnson, you don't want him. You want to get rid of that contract. You release him. We're not going to, we're not trading assets to you to help you out and, and, you know, give you a second round pick so you can draft another Braden point. Right. So I, I feel like the league is finally starting to figure out when teams are in cap trouble, hang them out to dry put down the phone because that's when you get a situation like i imagine wherever mark andre Fleury goes assets are going to go with him yeah probably but that's not where it's going to be you know that's not where cap crunch is going to come because people are also going to do it by need that that's why like when we're talking about goalies went on day one because everybody knows they're going to need two two obviously but three even more so right so if they know this, then obviously then you're going to take care of that part of your agenda early. And the Flyers sat back and, and watched as all that happened on day Picked one of free agency and went, we have Carter well, Hart and not only on the ELC. We good. Right. Well, and not only that, but okay. And here's the thing. Would it be nice to add another top four defenseman before the season starts? Sure. Absolutely it would. But here's the thing too. You got expi- you got an expiring contract for Carter Hart next year. And you're going to have to sign yep. him and, and who and knows how much to. money it's going to be. In. And I believe that we said, which deal was it that I pointed out that I said was going to be a comparable for him right away. I was it, was it, it was the Matt Markstrom Murray. or was it the Murray deal? Yeah. I Murray, believe it was maybe, Matt Murray. At least in term and maybe not quite cap hit, but like close. I mean, his cap hit was what was it? Six. I'm looking it up right now. I believe it was five years, 6 million. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, Matt Murray is making 6.25 million for the next four years. Right, and I and I don't know if I'm like. And here's the thing: Matt Murray is making 6.25 million, also probably because he's got cup credentials. And I think some of that's the Ottawa tax. The, it could the, be, yeah. The I'm gonna play for a real bad team. Although now, honestly, Ottawa looks scary, man. Like I, they've I, made some really good improvements. Because yeah. like, here's the thing about last year's Ottawa team: they weren't 
bad like the Colorado Avalanche were historically bad a couple years ago. They weren't bad like the Detroit Red Wings are just kind of bad. They were fun, exciting, bad. And they played a lot of tight games. I'm curious how many of those games where where you're you're close for the first two periods and then in the third period, the better team kind of runs away with it. Does Matt Murray flip that script and get Ottawa? Like Matt Murray might get Ottawa an additional 15, 20 points in the standings. So he, I don't know if that's insane. So he, I went to go and try to look up everybody they've added. So I wanted to, I wanted to just pull up a roster and NHL.com doesn't update the rosters completely with the sign with the signings. Of course not. Well, no, but no, no, just hear the, hear me out with this. Cause we'll laugh at this. So aside from, I guess, I mean, was this a, there was a trade, right? They traded for good Branson. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. And they traded the other day or yesterday they traded for Austin Watson from Nashville. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, but I'm saying, so those are two ads by trade. So they are on the roster. So consider those two new players and then realize that on the roster, I guess from last year, (laughs) they have two goalies, five defensemen and six forwards. Yeah. Yeah. That's the returning team. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at their cap friendly right now. Uh, They have seven as of today, they have seven forwards with contracts. Colin White, Artem Anisimov, Austin Watson, Joshua Norris. I don't know who that is. Brady Kachuk, Logan Brown, Drake Batherson. That's it. Uh, on defense, they do have six defensemen, right? They have Shabbat. They traded for Nikita Zaitsev and then extended him. That trade happened uh, Saturday night. We'll talk about that a little bit. They have Goodbranson for one more year. Mike Riley, Joshua Brown. That's another created character on NHL 21. Uh, and Christian Wallanen. So they do have six defensemen. Uh, they need to do a lot of work on the forward core here. They still have Connor Brown as an RFA. Chris Tierney is an RFA. Rudolph Balsers is an RFA. And Nicholas Paul is an RFA. So they do have some some team control assets, right? That's formal. They do. And, and then, you know, to shift gears really quick back to the draft for a minute, because that's but, where they did it. They did a lot of their work, too. I mean, they had three picks in the first round of the draft. Right. And you run away with. And then I think four one more the, in the second, like they had an absurd number of, picks. but they, but just in the first round alone, you end up with one of the top forwards, probably the top defenseman, quite possibly, arguably one of the top two. And then another forward who was rising through the ranks that a lot of people liked. Yep. I mean, at 28, they really got a good player. And, and we talk about the fact that Ottawa needs to sign everybody under the sun because they don't have anybody signed. Take a guess at how much cap space the Ottawa Senators have right now. Now, and again, I will mention that they are not a cap team. Eugene Melnick has said that they will not be spending the cap. Right. So they probably have $40 million. They have $28 million in cap space. Okay. 27.7. You, by you saying that they weren't going to spend the cap, I altered my answer and, and jumped to 40. I was going to say 30 originally. Okay. 30 sounded more realistic, but I'm but like, they, oh, they, if they have me come that out thing. and said that they're not going to spend the cap and that like, they're not going out and getting Alex Petrangelo, for example. Right. Um, it, honestly, you add Alex Petrangelo and Taylor Hall, you got a pretty good team up there in Ottawa because as of right yeah. now, Taylor Hall is also still unsigned, by the way. Yeah, but here's the thing. So I want to go and look at this list I had from free agency really quick because okay. I, I went and I looked. And I obviously, no, I didn't write down any goalies because a goalie wasn't a target, right? Like I put no, together a list. Of, <laughs> well, no, not for Ottawa, but oh, 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 okay. I'm talking about like from the flyer standpoint now because I wrote down lists of who they could go after, all that type of stuff defensively four of the names signed on day one eventually like early on it was nobody i think right i think we went a couple hours with no it took three all really i'd say it took three hours and that was when shattenkirk signed okay and then um krug signed at krug signed later right or was he He, earlier he signed 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 later uh i think he signed no no but krug signed before brody right uh right before yeah they they those those happened were they close together and by the way, Tory like, Tory Crew to the St. Louis Blues, that's a good signing. It's a, it's an interesting signing to me a little bit. Like I'm not saying that he doesn't fit there. It's not that. It's that was kind of their like I can't tell if it means that they're out on Petrangelo or they have not. To be. They have like, to. Like I assume that too. But then they said they weren't. Like they said that they weren't. It wasn't out of the realm of possibilities. And this is the same team that traded for Justin Falk last summer. Yeah, I know. I Joel Edmondson know. for Justin Falk essentially was that deal. The, the, <sighs> the late drop on the late Nate, the late drop on um defenseman on the first day of free agency or whatever you however you want to call it, like first night, whatever. Yeah. yeah. It was Chris Tanev was late. Chris Tanev was, was a late. later one at night. Yep. But but forward wise, 
among the list that I at least wrote down, and, and I'm going to tell you right now, my the list that I wrote down does not include Taylor Hall because I didn't think that the Flyers were going to go that level, right? At this point. So the list I had only had two names come off of it on day one. Okay. And they were both bottom end, take a flyer on them kind of guys. You know <laughs> what I mean? You did there. Tyler Ennis was one of them. Okay. And, Bob, and Bobby Ryan was the other. And Bobby yeah. Ryan was one of the first to sign. He went to Detroit it, one year, $1 million. And honestly, I think that's a good deal for him. He's going to get Yeah, I do too. Oh, I do too. I'm not saying it's not. He's going to get a chance to play a ton of minutes. He makes a million bucks for one year. He's got a chance to do well and get paid next year. Right. But then out of the list of forwards still, then the only two more came off on day two. Okay. Miko Koivu and Craig Smith. And Miko Koivu, like, listen, I'm not writing those some of those names down because I'm sitting there going, that's the right guy for them to sign per se, or that it's a guy who's going to make a lot of noise. It's, this is targets because this is what people are talking about. They want a low end veteran forward who right. can play in your bottom six or middle six and feel like a contributor. Uh, and and Cer- Koivu back- would have been a four C possibly three C who you could have put some trust in. If Nolan Patrick wasn't healthy. I was about to say circling back a little bit. Would we be targeting either of these guys? If we knew Nolan Patrick was healthy, uh, Bobby Ryan, maybe because Bobby I, Ryan's I'm, right. I'm talking about the centers. I'm talking about Koivu and Craig Smith, right? Well, Craig Smith was a winger too, and Craig Smith was more of a winger who who I thought would have been the type of guy that you throw in there, just because he shoots first and he's a power play guy. Like you could put okay. him on, you could put him on a third third line winger and second power play and get a lot more production out of him than you think. And does at three point one million, it wasn't that bad of a deal, and Boston that, is a lot better for it. Yeah, but okay, if you sign Craig Smith for that role for that deal, why is JVR still on your team? Well, at that point in time, you'd have there'd have to be something else that happens. I agree. Right. Because at that point, you're that what you just described: third line, second power play. You know, shoot first kind of guy. You kind of just described JVR. Yeah, I mean, and maybe that's where you stick because he's under a larger contract. And and granted, everything that the Flyers are doing right now has the expansion in mind. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm going to make a bold prediction here. Okay. Flyers are going to be a team that gives up a first round pick to get rid of James Van Riemsdyk. I hope you're wrong about the first round pick. Well, but... I mean, I do too, but I'm just looking at the prices people paid when Vegas was coming in. But that's the type of guy that they are going to try to unload instead of giving up somebody they don't want to give up. You're right. right. And I mean, it's, it's one of those things that they I, already know that, but this is because yeah. like TJ Brody would have been really nice as a flyer because he's a left-handed defenseman who plays right side. Primarily he's a puck mover. He's not a defensive liability. He gives you a lot of the things that they were looking for in a, and, and gives you minutes. So he gives you a lot of things you were looking for as a near Niskin in replacement, because I agree with, with what Chuck Fletcher said. It's hard to replace a guy like Niskanen who Definitely. gives you a, lo- a little bit of everything. That being said, as soon as there was a no move clause in there, and I know it doesn't prevent him from going on being like protected from expansion, whatever. Like that's not what I'm talking about here. It doesn't matter. You're going, if you're, you're either going to make a commitment to that guy or you're not. Right. And if you're not going to make the commitment to that guy, then, or if you are going to make the commitment to that guy, then it means you're going to leave a, a exposed either one of your budding defensemen probably Sandheim or Myers, or you're going to have to protect only four forwards. And that means that somebody like Oscar Lindblom is out there. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I have a feeling the flyers are going to be in a position where they're going to be trading assets to protect, but this is this Scott to me is, or whoever, maybe, but even then I like, I almost not wonder if you count that as well. Here's the thing about Scott Lawton. He's going to be up for a new contract too next year. So teams tend to shy away from the, f- I'm going to be a free agent in expansion. Oh yeah. They can float him till after the expansion draft. Right. So you can say I, we have his rights. And if you want to select him for his rights, go right ahead. But if you aren't sure and you know, like that you can sign him team and the expansion team stay away from that. They want a guy who they get, who they a go. Certainty. Is he under contract? Yeah, that's why we like, like, that's why, like, that's why you want to protect Limblom because Limblom's going to have two years left on his contract at $3 million and can put points up. Yep. And, and an expansion team score goals. Ooh, like an expansion team's going, ooh, cheap and productive and young and young and a great story. Right. Which, I mean, good PR is not a bad thing for a new franchise. Sure. But, you know, yeah. Well, was it Jerry Bruckheimer has stake in this team? He'll make a movie about him, I'm sure, or something like that. I'm you know? sure. Yeah, like you get could with that story. Um, oh, absolutely. I'm surprised it's not already being written. Nonetheless, it was it was just easy to throw that 
to name drop that one out there because he is actually yeah, so <laughs> partial. But but so what I was trying to get at with this is that none of the forwards, though, like that's only four forwards I mentioned. I have a list of ten. So there's still I was about to say, give me, give, me, give me two names that you want the Flyers to go after here. Um, I was interested. I, I t- take interest in Mikel Granlin. Okay. Uh, let's just kind of that know, bottom six forward role. I, yeah. right, I don't know if they're going to go after a guy like this because it might be too pricey forward wise, anyway, especially since you have a hole defensively. Like, let's not gloss right. over you, that. But you have to get sign a defenseman probably or trade for one. And, and right. again, what goes into that? Like, because here's the thing, if you traded for a defenseman who better fits that role, that top four role, and say, let's let's say that even in doing that, you traded Shane Goss to spare. Because, by the way, the, the three guys we have penciled in the top four right now are Provorov, Sanheim, Myers. So we're looking for a fourth guy to fill out that top four, more than likely. Don't be right? surprised. Uh, uh, look, everybody out there who's listening, you, Kyle, can think this. think of this what you will. They called Chuck Fletcher called Shane Goss to spare a top four defenseman yesterday. And to one on one hand, he's if not you're wrong. shopping them. If you're shopping them, I feel well, like there, there might be you a might be PR you might be there. pumping his tires. There I'm might not be a saying. little PR going on there. But here's the thing: if they think he's as healthy as he's been in three years, and he gets a full off season, he at, certainly at didn't health, look bad during the bubble. Well, and here's the thing: he barely played during the bubble. Like, but when he was there, he played well. No, but but he barely played, so he couldn't reaggravate the injury. He's fresh, so he's having a normal off season that is an unknown an off extended season. off season, yeah. right? Right, basically, basically March to January, right. probably at least January. And I'm not saying that he's going to save this thing or anything like that. I'm just saying, don't be surprised if they decide they want to give him one more shot. And you know what? At this and, point, and maybe time, that has to maybe that has to do with. We tried to move the contract and nobody's taken. So well, we got to let him go out there and see if he gives us anything that's worth moving. Yep. And the nice thing is we talked about running it back, right? And, and right. we're running it back minus Niskanen. But if Shane Gostaspear gets back to, let's say, 80% of, you know, where he was kind of the first two or three years he was up playing for the Flyers. If he gets back to, say, 80% of that, I don't have a problem with that guy playing second pair of minutes with, Phil Myers or Travis Sanheim or whoever ends up down on the second pair with them. Right. Well, and it's interesting because see, here's the thing. I think Justin Braun could play top four minutes because I think that his pair and just hear me oh, out. Man, I'd sure rather he didn't. Well, just, just hear me out. There is no minute differential here at five on five. That's okay. Fair. They realistically play almost the same amount of minutes at five on five. All, all Alain Vino does roll pretty aggressively. Okay. Yeah. Justin Braun with Travis Sanheim was not as much of a dumpster fire as Justin Braun with Shane Goss's bear or Justin Braun with Robert Hake, which is what you are looking at. If you tr- roll it out traditionally, yeah. like, I'd almost rather bury the Goss's bear Hague pairing and say, all right, Justin Braun, you've been there before you've done it before. And I need you to be as good as you can be. And for the most of the regular season, he wasn't bad, by the way. Like we didn't have no, this. For sure. We didn't have this talk until more, more or less playoffs because everybody just, Tend to remember the last series fine. they played. I mean, well, doesn't everybody just remember the last series they played? Because can I sure. talk about how on day one of free agency, there are rumors out there, and TSN even buys into it and puts Travis Konechny at 14th or 17th or whatever the hell he was on their trade bait list, because that was who was talked about as a guy who people thought it was going to take to get Patrick Line. I was going to say, and, let's and address the people, elephant in the room: the Patrick Line rumors, and, and yeah. or whatever you wanted to get, and it's like people were willing to do it. Are you like honestly, if you wanted to trade Travis Connecting, are you out of your mind to trade a 24 year old who has put up 24 goals consistently in the regular season in the last three seasons? If you're not out of your mind, if specifically if you're getting exactly Patrick Line, because and well, this will this will lead us nicely into our draft talk because a lot of this talk kind of kicked up. On the day okay. of the draft, right? Because we're we're right after right. Matt Niskin in retirement, and you know, Flyers fans are all of a sudden we have this cap space, we have to spend it, right? But if if the Flyers did truly seriously pursue Patrick Lyon, and mm-hmm. I believe Chuck Fletcher probably made a call. I don't know if there was an offer. I don't know if it was just conversation, but I, I'm willing to bet that Chuck Fletcher there was enough smoke that I I believe there was some fire there. Enough okay. people were reporting it, right? If you're seriously talking to Winnipeg about acquiring Patrick Line, mm-hmm. I imagine Travis Konechny is probably one of the names to go. Because 
I think a lot of this fan base, and I'm not sure if the, the organization looks at it like this, but I think the fan base looks at Travis Konechny as kind of a goal scorer of the future, right? Like he's, he's working his way towards being that goal scoring guy. Patrick Lyonet is just better at the goal scoring portion of that. Now, I'm not saying right. he's a better hockey player. I'm not saying he's a better whatever because Patrick Lyonet plays a 40 foot game. But in terms of this team filling a need of a pure goal scorer, there are not many better people in the league than Patrick Lyonet to fill that role. All right. And that's fair. I won't disagree with that part of it. To me, Patrick Lyonet is the guy that you go and get when everything else has fallen into place and you can afford him that you finally say it's go time. And I say a goal scorer is a luxury. So you usually either have to build it yourself and find the kid in the draft who is that guy. So you get him from the very get go, or you have to go out and sign him in free agency. It's why everybody's talking about Taylor hall because, and I'm not saying Taylor Hall's is necessarily a pure goal scorer. He's a very good offensive player. The point being you sign that guy when you know, you can afford him as a contender and you go, this is going to balance out everything else. This is the X factor. This is the guy who with a minute left in a game, I need the puck on his stick to take that shot because I know he can score and I know what I'm getting at him. And, but you do it after you, you do it after you have the goalie locked up long-term after the defense core is locked up long-term. Like it's right. not and that easy to add a pure goal score. There's not many of them out there. Well, we've been talking the whole show about running it back and this team made it to game seven of the second round. Are they not there? Right? Like, Short of a Carter Hart extension, why well, aren't right. the Flyers ready to do that? As we're talking today, they're not. That's what I'm saying. Like, okay. Well, why is we, that? Oh, right? no. We're talking about this team running it back, and we're talking about they made it to the second round, and they're a contender, and they well, were no, no, a top no. five team I'm, in the I'm league. Saying, the I'm saying a week. Down. I'm saying a week ago, if you were told you like, and again, they wouldn't. This wouldn't have been the case a week ago if you had eight million dollars in cap space and still had the same roster then you're in, posi- in a position to add somebody who puts you over the so top. So you think losing Matt Niskan was a big enough blow that the Flyers should not put the pedal to the metal and go for it? You trade, trade no, the cabinet, because, empty the cabinet for a for a well, couple. No, right there's two, and there's two for me. There's two reasons why. One, Matt Niskan leaves a hole that you can't leave unaddressed in the off season, one way or another. I, agree. I mean, <laughs> you have to add somebody, in my opinion. I don't know who that is. And I'm not saying like it's it might not even be somebody who we sit there at the end of the day and go, that's definitely a pure number you know top four right. like honestly it might not be but you have to do something before the end of this whole thing that shows that you recognize that you had to add a player that's supposed to replace something that matt niskin is that you've lost with niskin and whether it's leadership whether it's work ethic whether it's just penalty kill ability for all so, i care like so it, you it don't needs think to be a piece you don't think right now Ivan Provorov, Phil Myers, Travis Sanheim, Robert Hag, Shane Gossespear, and Justin Braun. You don't think that core is good enough to win a cup? No. Okay. And I because think that's totally fair. Not not right now. Like, I think that in the future it could be. I think that you have to bear in mind that you have to let it grow. You have to of be course. patient with the approach. You know, because let's put it this way. If you really wanted to go get the goal scorer and you wanted to try to fill the void of everything else, you could have gone out there, spent all the money you wanted in the world on TJ Brody or tried to go for Petrangelo or whatever you want to talk about and fully accepted that one of these three young players that we just mentioned, Provorov, Sanheim, Myers, is not going to be a flyer after next year because of expansion. You can fully accept that if that's the way you want to go. And you can go out there and you can make a trade that gets you Patrick Laine if you want to fully accept that you're going to give up earlier than you expect probably Travis Sanheim, possibly Travis Konechny. Like, do you want to give up that many assets? Like, right. The the thing that I tweeted the other day was that when Chuck Fletcher got hired, the message was don't go trading all the prospects. Don't go and make the deals that were Zach Parise, Ryan Suter, 13 years at $8 million per whatever they are making. It was something high like that and get locked into a horrible contract. Contracts are those contracts just reached their halfway point about 18. Right. But that's, there you go. That's what I'm saying. Like, that was the thing. Don't go do that. Don't be Paul Holmgren 2.0. And then free agency rolled around this particular year. You have some cap space. You have a hole that is not easily addressed because of the fact that you know that expansion, like expansion screws it up a lot for teams. Oh yeah. Because if you Especially have with good the way prospects, the flyers are built. you know, you're stuck. Yep. If, if, if the Flyers are playing the waiting game right now because and, and nobody helped Tampa Bay with Tyler Johnson because we're not taking just taking $5 million in cap space from you 
to make it easier, life easier for you because you have three big name RFAs you want to sign. We're not making with what three million dollars of cap space. They're two point nine, I think, is what it is. Like it, it's like it's that, not yeah. it's not good, right? So you're not bailing them out for anything. And, and oh by the way, like Vegas is in the same boat. Vegas, if you sign Petrangelo, you're over cap. Yep. The last thing you should do is sign a guy like Petrangelo or other that puts you over cap. So you have to be the one who unloads it, and everybody knows that you're in the position. You're the team that that's desperately right. right. You're the team if trying to unload Mark Andre Fleury with a second round trades. pick. Right. Correct. So sit back, be patient, let it play out, and see who's out there later. I'm not saying don't uh, don't address it, and I'm not saying that it can't grow. But do you want to run the risk of losing a top prospect, a former top prospect that you were so excited about getting here? By the way, you were so excited about giving him minutes. Everybody out there was play the kids, play the kids, play the kids. That was the problem with Hextall. Play the kids. Why aren't the kids up? Where's Carter Hart? Where's Travis Sanheim? Where's Phil Myers? Call them up. Come on. Right. That was the whole thing. And now they're up. You want to give them time and call me crazy, but I don't want to lose those guys for nothing. No, no, I agree. And, and it's, it's a question of, we've talked a lot on this show about the window, right? Right. The flyers could probably put the pedal to the metal and win a cup in the next two years. Probably they have the assets. They could make the moves. They, they probably could. Right now, or at least well, put themselves in a position to win a cup. Obviously, you know, things change or they can do what it looks like they're going to do. Take it a little bit slower. Mm-hmm. And then over the next 10 years, you have the chance to win three cups. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. Like, look, Patrick line is a luxury and we talked about running it back. And if, if they ran it back from last year, exact roster, maybe I'm not as hesitant to part ways with one of those defensive prospects. If Niskanen's still there and I go pro Rob Niskanen's one pairing Myers is taking steps. Sandheim's taking steps. I like that pairing, but if I have to part ways with one of them and I still have Justin Braun on my third pair and Robert Higgs are like, here's the thing. I'd give Shane Goss bear one more chance. If I couldn't unload him, if I tried my best to pump up, pump up the, you know, the pump up the numbers, on him pump up the analytics and, 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 get him and, out of and try to get him out of here at that contract. And it didn't work. And I turned around and I said, all right, fine. I got another contract that's about 3.2 million. And it's the same position, same handedness defenseman, same kind of quality to an extent, maybe a better defender. And I can include that to get the goal scorer I so desperately need. Then that maybe I do better. it. Yeah. Like I was willing to, if it meant getting Patrick Line, I would have probably been willing to trade Travis Sanheim with Matt Niskin in here. You take Niskin and out. Now I can't get rid of any of the other ones left unless it's Goss to spare at that contract. And I go, now I'm going to fill the void of getting rid of that contract with a guy who is legitimately fitting that role. Right. Like that's when it comes into play. But otherwise I don't want to get into this game. I can't no. trade one of those young guys for that because, and that's, that's just the way it is. And I told you this before we started recording. I woke up this morning to a comment of stop with the young guys growing thing. Like, then how did Tampa Bay win a Stanley Cup? It's the most nonsensical comment of all time. How did Tampa Bay win a Stanley Cup? Turns out players get better. Whoa. (laughs) Well, if that's the way, no, if that's the way that somebody really feels, that if they're like, oh, young players grow, young players grow. Then when Travis Konechny scores 30 goals next year for Winnipeg because you wanted the guy who you knew was giving you 35. Who you knew was going to score and, 40. And, right. No, no. It, okay. And, and how do you know he's going to score 35 or 40? What happens if Line gets hurt in that first year? You traded away the guy who then scores 30. They even out. And Patrick Line has been streaky. He might score 22 next year just because he right. scores them all Don't in the get first burned month. Because yeah. you like the name. By also, trading away a guy who also helps. Like I'm like, I'm just saying Patrick like, Line will not do well in this market because he'll go two weeks without scoring a goal and and the pressure will be on. Yeah. And I'm not saying he won't do well in this market. The market won't do well they with him. Right. Let's, because let's the fact that goal scores are streaky. Exactly. Right. Like, well, it's this way. Even the best goal scorer that we've ever seen in our own lifetime, or mostly our lifetime. Like I like because I'm you're, you're Wait, discussing Wayne, Alexander Ovechkin, correct? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Well, because I'm I'm talking about the time where we're actually going to remember some of the stuff. Yeah, like, right. not Wayne Gretzky played for seven years. Yeah, Wayne of Gretzky my life. as a Ranger doesn't count. <laughs> but nonetheless, like Ovechkin was pushing 700 goals, right? And how long did it take before he got there? A couple like, of weeks, I think. The knowledge of yeah. the significance of the milestone, just the just the general nature of being a goal scorer with people target 
can take time to get that. Like he took what eight games to finally get to seven. He was like at six ninety eight, and everybody he was on it for a he while. He was at six ninety eight, and everybody went, "Oh, it's coming! It's going to come as soon as this weekend, maybe." And then all of a sudden, this weekend turned into next weekend, and turned into the week after that. I think, and it took him that long to get. It stretched out a little bit further it. than he'd probably like. like. That was yeah. when he went on that streaky display, where all of a sudden it was here it comes and it and that's not to say you don't know you're getting what you're getting from him for a whole year yes you are getting 40 goals a year from alex ovechkin sure easily usually pushing 50 but it doesn't mean that you're not going to go through stretches where when he doesn't have the hat trick on two out of five games that you're also not going to get the the nights where three or four nights in a row he doesn't show absolutely you know let's this way how did ovechkin look in the playoffs this year the whole washington team looked a little checked out understood but i'm saying are we going to base next year off of that one bad series? No, absolutely not. Okay, so why are we doing that with Travis Konechny? Why are we taking Travis Konechny 16 games and saying, in the playoffs, you didn't look good in an unusual year. Now we're done. Yeah, I'm not, How I'm, easy is it to I'm not sure how many people. Goals? I'm not sure how, I mean, how many people who are seriously looking at Travis Konechny are saying that. Well, I, agreed. I'm like, I'm, my point in saying that is, how easy is it to replace 24 goals? Not, not very. Right. 24 like, not, is pretty significant. Right, exactly. Like that's a, still a significant number. Like they don't, you don't just get twenty four goals that easy from that he's the only average his, player. He, he just finished what his third full year, fourth, fourth full year. Like, yep, because that was the first year after the ELC. So right. he signed a new contract, then delivered on it in the regular season because he had the best offensive season he's had to this point. And Cut also, forward. only played seventy games, by the way. Not even yeah, the se- Well, the season only went to seventy games, yeah, right? He, he didn't even six, have that last twelve. Yes, yeah, exactly. And he had, and he missed, and he missed three games with a concussion. Yep. But you know what? Since we're talking about kind of the future of the Flyers and where they're going, let's talk about who they selected in the 2020 NHL draft. Okay. Because uh, so Tuesday, Tuesday night, correct? Yes. Uh, Tuesday night, the draft kicked off and it was just the first round. Uh, the Flyers had one pick, 23rd overall. There's a lot of speculation. This is when kind of the line A hype was kind of at its uh, most fervent. And there was talk about trading that pick or trading up, trading down. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. Uh, the Flyers ended up keeping that pick and selecting Tyson Forrester from the Barry Colts of the OHL. Uh, what do you think about this kid? He had uh, 80 points in 62 games for Barry well, last year. Well, what do I think about him? Six goals. Here's, well, that's one, that for one, that's a nice number. Yes. And, 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 line, eh? well, well, no, here's the thing. And the OHL is a scoring league. So take it with a grain of salt that he scores that much, but he's got to uh, watch, watch some of the clips on him. He's got a really good shot. You're, you know, he gives me, believe it or not, he gives me that line a vibe because he sets up at the left side. He has a quick release that shot that can go bar down like yeah. that. Like he's got a good release. Don't get me wrong. Um, I, I, I guess to give you my full thoughts on what, what I think of this, when we did the show last week, I gave you targets. You sure did. And, and the name that I had on the board was there when they picked at 23 or that I gave you last week as my top target. And they did not pick that guy, but that's okay. Because the second name I gave you was Tyson Forrester. Yep. There you go. So, that was like the, that was my one too, you know? And so like there was that, cause there was that striking moment of disapp- not disappointment, but like Chuck Fletcher's announcing the pick. And as soon as he says the team name, I know it's not Jacob Perot. Like I had said, I also wanted I knew Jacob what, Perot for the record because, because I knew what team he was. So I was waiting to hear Sarnia. And then all of a sudden, so I'm, I hear him say from Barry and I'm going, Oh no, I don't even know who this is. Like I, it didn't strike you off the top of my head. I didn't remember didn't what team I didn't remember what Forrester. team anybody else played for at that given moment. And then he said the name, he says Tyson Forrester. And I'm like, Oh, oh. wait a minute. That's okay, the next guy down. Like, I'm yeah. like, that's, that's fine. That's great. And not only that, but I think if I'm not mistaken, looking at the rest of the list, those were the only two targets I had left that were wow. still on the board because Lucas Reichel went 17. Dawson Mercer was gone at like t- what? 2018, something, something like that. Like that. Yeah, he went um, Hendricks LaPierre went 22 right before in Washington traded. Yeah, up I was him. really hoping Hendricks LaPierre would fall. I, 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 as the draft developed and he started slipping a little bit, I really was kind of hoping that he would fall to 20. You know what? I, I, I was disappointed. They didn't get him and I'm happy. They didn't get him at the same time. And I'll tell you why I was disappointed because when, when a guy falls that far, yeah, like you're one pick away, and he was definitely projected higher than that. So yeah, that's exciting when he. But falls then there's that also that issue of well, why did he fall though? Well, not only well, I knew why he fell. It was and it was injury history. And my thought was, quite frankly, do we really need to see them pick another player that we're comparing to Nolan Patrick? Right, like, do we need another example of what? Like, here's Nolan Patrick hasn't played that much. You know, hasn't been able to stay healthy. Do we really need another example of that there is nothing on Tyson Forrester that has anything to do with his health? 
right he now plays, and now, he's gonna the one question about tyson forrester that i have here is how much of this season was his true talent right because last year uh the 2018 uh, 19 season he only had 10 goals and 23 points and I, I know how junior works and you, you tend to break out in your draft year. That's kind of how the, mm-hmm. the, the system is designed. I don't imagine uh, Tyson Forrester is going to be a serious contender to make the team. He'll probably hang out in camp for a while, maybe get right. a game or two because teams kind of like doing that one or two game thing before they send him back to juniors, just to give the kid a little bit of a taste. Right. Um, I don't see Tyson Forrester as a legit uh, roster member for the Philadelphia Flyers this season. It's not that it's a definite no. Right. And, so I'm very curious to see what he does going back to juniors, right? You're, you're a year older. Right. You should dominate. Cause now you're, you know, 19 years old playing with 16 year olds. You just got drafted. You got some development time at the NHL level with an NHL staff. Can you go back and dominate on the junior level and prove that his draft year wasn't a fluke? That's my only well, question with him, and it's a minor little question. Well, and here's the thing. like the, They say the knock on him is his skating, and I, I asked him – one of the questions I asked him when we had the press call was, do you – you know, what have you been doing for the last kind of six months? Like, to understand, like how has the last six months been because of the fact that you haven't played a game? Like, March, your season ends. And for a long and, time, ice was a little sketchy. Well, not only that, but it's also, ice. Well, for one, but also – there's this tent. You have a tentative December date hanging over your head. That's what the OHL is going off of and the WHL. They're going off of a December date that they've talked about for a few months. You didn't have any playoff. Like there was no like OHL playoffs. There was no Memorial cup, right? They just canceled what, everything. They just there. canceled everything. So what has the last six months been like for you? Because first of all, it's your draft year. Who knows what your stock is like. If you get a playoff and you get Memorial cup time, like yep. not that you, not that everybody makes the Memorial cup, but you get a playoff that gets you there. You're motivated to get there. So yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think Barry was going to be a, a Memorial Cup contender. No, year. no, no. But like, but I think that they might have been in the running to be one of like those borderline playoff teams. And, and even then, even then, even if your team doesn't go as far, if you if step you up and have a couple, a couple of big of games, games yeah. in, in big stages, your draft stock can rise, you know, can go Absolutely. on the rise. So kind of what are you doing? And he, and he immediately talked about how he got he has a couple different coaches. One of them is a skating coach. He's worked with him for several months and took him right away. So he's been on the ice. He's worked on his skating. And you generally like I think we when we talk about stats when it comes to draft picks, I think you're like you're right when you say like your draft year, you should be to really be a legitimate talent. You should be roughly like you should be put it like at that at that level, I, I should say, like first round pick level. Junior you teams be, tend to highlight their big name prospects. Oh, for sure. And yeah. you should be give you should be point per game better than point per game in your draft year specifically. And if he was with are, 36 goals and oh, 44 yeah. assists, 80 points, 62 games. He can't, can't be upset about that the at th- all. No. And the, th- the thing that really shows it is if in your draft plus one year, you go even higher. Exactly. Like that's, and I, I look, I think that every single team, I, I, I mentioned this briefly before we got on and started recording. I think that one player from this year's draft is on an NHL roster come January or whenever it is. And, and that'll be the New York Rangers that's, and Alexis right, Lafreniere. Right. That's it. It's it's Lafreniere and that's it. Other than and, that, and, that I, and I mentioned to you that I think in a normal year, I think Quentin Byfield probably makes the Kings. Well, let's put it this way. I, I, I could I could alter that decision a little not decision, Stuttle but I could, alter, could easily I could, make the senators. <laughs> Well, right, because I didn't say like the Senators, if they have a lot of contracts open, then Stutzla may decide if, if he can get a spot quickly. Sure, he can come over. You know, I don't know if Jake Sanderson's going right away. Yeah, if, probably like, not. His defenseman's a little trickier, but I think a lot of teams this particular draft made picks that they know are four years out. A lot of European players in the first round. A yeah. lot of guys, and and traditionally, European players especially KHL players. There were a decent number of KHL players in the first round. And there's sometimes a little bit of a question where it takes them two or three years to come over. Well, and even, you know, and even I think a guy teams who were a little less hesitant about it this year. But even, even a guy who I had on my targets list, like Dylan Holloway, who I knew was going to probably go 15 or something in that range. He's a college kid. So a college kid gives you time too. like, you sit there and you go, if you want to play college for four years or well, in his case, three more years, because he just completed his freshman year. Oh, and there's questions about if the NCAA is going to play this year. So there is some factor there, but but, that's what teams are doing. I think is that they're looking ahead three, four years and going, if we don't see this kid for three, four years and he just continues to grow. And are we okay with that? Well, not only are we okay with that, but I think like everybody knows that next year is not going to be a normal hockey season either. And because of that, if you can just get them back, like if the kids can get back playing them on the ice, like, let's put it this way. 
I want to mention a couple of the other players. Yeah, I want to I want to hit on the second round pick before we yeah before we get out of here. Oh, well, sure. we, I think we should hit on a couple of them actually because Definitely. here's the thing. So, so Emil Andre is the second round pick, and he you know here's here's a Swedish. And by the way, played yesterday, I believe. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he's playing in the SHL, so he's you almost know. almost point per game last year. By the way, thirty eight points in forty games. Well, that was um, what's called that was um, the, the, was the that super league. elite? Uh, HV seventy one Sweden junior. Oh, yeah, so okay, super elite. Yeah, so he that that's the junior. Yeah, I was gonna say because he's not point per game at the Swedish elite league yet, but he's no, uh, but at eighteen years old, you don't necessarily expect him to be. No, nah, but in seven games, he's he's got one assist and he's a plus two so far. Or he's plus one. I'm sorry, and that's pretty significant too yeah and this is a guy that is looking to serve kind of an offensive purpose um i kind of have him penciled in as a guy when they eventually get rid of the shane gostas bear contract whether well, it's, he's very much the build is very much the he's same very shane gostas berry and i don't know like it, it sounds pretty good right he, <laughs> he is but at the same time like I, the stuff i read on him is that he's much more of a will like has much more of a willing willingness to be physical so that's okay. i think the key difference for him i'm gonna go back to i'll go back to the fourth round pick in a minute because i do want to talk about him specifically best name in the best name of the flyers pick but i want to go sure. but since we're touching on the fact like like i said emil andre second round pick play literally played this weekend in sweden right fifth round pick elliot de Noyer, also played the other day huh. and you know what no you want to know what else happened scored his first goal of the season the other day look at that for Halifax so there you go the and, and he is supposed to be because his numbers are not great like if you look on the surface you sit there and you say okay for a seventh or seventh for a fifth round pick in his draft year 35.61 games it's not insane okay but then you look at the team he was on and, and they even said he was on probably the best junior team in 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 the CHL right at the time right, of they the were pause. the Memorial Cup favorites right certainly. at the time of the pause so he has 11 goals and 35 points as a I guess a third line as a role player, right. right. As a role player for the best junior team in the game. And now he is an alternate for We're Halifax an Yep. and in three games has a goal and two assists. He's a point per game player right now. And yeah. I know it's early, With but one thing is that he, he already knew the role is going to increase. He wanted the increased role and he's going to probably have a really good draft plus one year. If that's how you want to classify it. Right. And I was going to say with, with uh, beyond say the third round, it's, your draft plus one year almost functions like your draft year for a first, second, third round player, right? Like that's the year you're supposed to dominate is your draft plus one. Well, what was, you know, let's, let's do a fun experiment and I'll go back to the guy who I pulled up. Cause I do, I'm going to talk to this about the sixth round pick, but let's do a fun experiment for a minute. And I just want to look at somebody's numbers for a minute. Okay. Leading into his draft year. So let me see what the numbers would have been. I guess this would have been, is this a this, this is a current flyer? Yes, it is. Right. I feel like I, you already know who I'm. Gonna Am I guessing? Play. No, I don't. Am I? I'm guessing who this is here. You can guess. Yes. Okay. All so right. this this particular player, this particular player, played in 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 a junior league in North America. Now, if I tell you that, then it's going to give it away much easier. Okay, so it's Europe. It. Okay, I got it. <laughs> All right, and in in 43 games, had 33 points. Okay. Okay. This is this is his draft year. And then, the, and then by the next year was playing professionally okay, and, and continued to build until he was a pro player in North America. Is this Oscar Lindblom? Yes, it is. Okay. Oscar Lindblom, so. in his draft, Oscar Lindblom in his draft year playing in the under 20 super elite league had 13 goals and 33 points in his draft year in 43 games and, yep. and, and played and had basically had a taste, the smallest taste, four games in the SHL. Then the next year, he is more of an SHL player than he is anything else. Plays 37 games, eight goals, 15 points. With big men. Step, right, big step when you're playing pro. Right. And then, and then it continues. Eight goals, 25 points in 48 games. Again, the best Swedish league out there, one of the best European leagues out there. By the way, also signs and comes over and plays at the end of his Swedish season, plays with the Phantoms for eight games and has seven points in eight games. Yeah, in his first good. taste in North America. Then all of a sudden, here it comes: twenty-two goals, forty-seven points, fifty-two games in the Swedish Elite League in 2016-17. And by the end of that year, it was over. Yep, he was a professional player, and he was getting a taste of the NHL and playing, you know, sixteen goals and thirty-four points in the AHL. Right. So there yeah. you go. But that's that. 
that's why numbers in that year when you're playing in a role, especially when you're just trying to get over from an European league to whatever, like you'll be able to build on it once you get hit with a higher role. So right. and specifically in um, Halifax's case, teams are a little less likely to coddle you and give you that that prime here you go buff your draft stock thing if they're trying to win right like halifax was full-blown we're going for the memorial cup we're going to put the best roster out there they didn't do a ton of coddling of their you know top prospect whatever right right? he might have been featured a little bit more if the team was kind of on that bubble and blah 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 but they were putting together the best roster they could and attempted to win the memorial cup yeah so so before i talk about the best name in the draft yeah i do want to talk about the sixth round pick too yeah, because um, Connor McLennan, Connor McLennan uh, from the Winnipeg a, Ice of the WHL, 49 points in 42 games, over 20, point per game is a sixth round pick. And 21 goals, which should only keep going up. I mean, he's a bit of an undersized player, which looks like 5'8", 168. Now, under, here's the problem. And I saw a good tweet about it because somebody even said undersized is anybody who's under six feet tall. So, like, sure. stop with that. He's also 18. And I know, right. well, I don't know about you. I don't think he's getting bigger, but the 157 pounds needs to get a little. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know about you, but I've gained a whole bunch of weight since I turned 18. Well, yeah, same here. <laughs> um, but well, and but honestly, he, he could grow another inch or two. It's not completely unreasonable. And, right. But nonetheless, I mean, I think he's, he's got, still going to be small. He's going to be small, but he's going to be a shooter type. It's the way the league's going anyway. Sure. And here's the thing. I was reading stuff on it. He sounded like he was much more of a mid pick than a late pick. Yeah, from everything like there were there were draft boards that ranked him in the top 100. Uh, one more one note on Connor McLennan. Uh, you know who his coach is, right? I know. Isn't it ironic? His his coach is his coach a is man James by the name Patrick. of James Patrick, who happens That's to be Nolan the Patrick's uncle, uncle of Nolan Patrick. <laughs> so, you know, listen, we'll, we'll take a little flyers. I mean, it's, whenever we can I get mean, it. It's, it's it's Winnipeg, you know, yeah. so you can't. All right. So the best name is it in the time draft. for the best name in the draft. Yes, it is. Go ahead. I'll let you say it because I know you love this so much. Go ahead. I'm going to get it. If, if this kid makes the show, I'm getting a jersey <laughs> one day. Zade, Z-A-Y-D-E, Zade Wisdom. Man, that's a good name. It is a good name. And, and let me tell you right now, I again, you look for point per game production or close to in that in that year. He had 59 59 and 62, 29 which, goals. Which, but to me, the bigger story, the bigger thing is the point increase to go from 10 points and three goals the year before in your first taste of OHL hockey to 59 points in 60 in 62 games with 29 goals. Yeah, this kid's going to be this kid's going to be good this year. First of all, he's going to be really good at his junior level this year. And second of all, this kid's heart is massive this is wayne simmons level heart for you speaking of wayne and simmons who uh, meant who's practically mentoring the kid you're right and not only that but now i want you to think about this dynamic for a minute so that means zade wisdom's gonna sign in toronto one day and well, i don't know about that but zade, <laughs> but zade was zade wisdom is from toronto and is playing in kingston yeah now, how hard is it going to be to get in touch with wayne simmons now that not, he's in toronto not hard at all right it's gonna be so, very simple this is, uh, I think people are going to love this pick. I think this was a fantastic draft, right? The Flyers didn't have a top 10 pick. They didn't trade for Patrick Line. They didn't sign out, you know, they didn't make any big catastrophic. But I think at each position, at each spot in the draft, they picked a player who's got a potential to contribute at the NHL level one. Day. Right. And I fully and they- expect Forrester to do so. I, I think Forrester's got a great shot. I think Wisdom's got a great shot. And I think Andre's got a decent shot too. Because, yeah, you're, if because, your first well, three picks make the draft, you've had a good draft. Well, and here's the, here's the thing. Qual- quality over quantity sometimes. I know we look at, like, this was this, I, I don't remember the last time I wrote draft articles. Right. Like, and did the day two, here's the, here's the day one guy. And we write about the day one guy right away, right? But then day two comes and it's, here we go. Here's all of the day two picks. And, and most of the time what I used to do and I stopped doing it this way because it was just too many separate articles to write. Like, let's just write one and cover the whole deal. Right. But I would write, here's the second round pick. Sometimes it was two second round picks. Here's the third round pick. Here's a fourth. Here's another fourth, like whatever. And then I'd start to get to the end of the day and say, forget it. I'll just write about the last four rounds. But, I, but I would write separate, but I would write separate pieces for the second rounders, the third rounders. Cause I, like, I felt like you're still getting a guy who's worth talking about that you would write a more extensive scouting report on. Right. So 
I didn't do that. And this is as small of, of a group as I can remember on day two from this team in a long time. Well, Four I was about total to say, picks. You, you mentioned quality over quantity. And one of the things Chuck Fletcher did is trade it up several times, right? Right. And I to, think that to get the get wisdom line, pick, you traded 116 and 147 with Tampa to get 94 overall. That right. gets his aid wisdom. Then in the fifth round, you trade 202 and 209 to the Nashville Predators for pick 135, which is phenomenal value if you ask me. Right. So you, you made a couple of trades rather than take, you know, two in the seventh, you got a it's fifth been, round pick. And if this guy, you know, if this Elliot, if this Elliot kid makes your team one day, you I'm trade gonna tell 202 you, and 209. I'm going to tell you something really funny because I got to laugh out of this. I saw my dad earlier this week and he, I was talking to him and he said, who's this other kid they got this destroyer kid. And he's talking about Daynoye. And I turned and he said, that, that's going to be his nickname when he comes yeah, you, up. You destroyer. notice I said Elliot, right? <laughs> yes. The, what, no, we don't want to do the French names. I'm going to wait until I hear him pronounce it. I haven't heard him speak yet. I'm going to wait until he day. pronounces it. Just, just, I, there's too many. I names. was on his, I was on his press call. I heard of him course. say it directly. So it, it's, it's Daynoye. Noye. De Noye. Okay, we got it. He plays in the QMJHL. I assume I don't know how to say his name. <laughs> but he plays in the QMJHL. He is very French. All right. I mean, uh, but regardless, he's got an, he's got an accent. Don't I would relatively about. speaking call this draft success. Would you agree with that? Yes, because here's here's and here's why. Forrester's going to be a good pick at that at that stage because it addresses like I don't want to say it addresses a need, but it's it's you picked a you picked a winger, a scorer. Hold on. And you picked a guy who shoots first, or is mainly shoot first, but is a playmaker who has the ability. And I, I, here's the problem. We keep talking about how they need a pure goal scorer, right? I think that that translates in a lot of different ways. Like you need a guy who not necessarily, that doesn't mean it's a guy who shoots first, but it's a guy who's more willing to take the shot than other times. Like if the fans won't be yelling, first, shoot. Right. But, but a guy who's 50, 50 on it, who, when the pass is there, I can make a good pass. But right. when the shot is there, I'm going to let her rip. Take the shot. Right. We right. You know what I mean? Like, IQ. But I think it's a good draft because other, down the road from the first round where we said they were going to get a good player, you know, Emil Andre wasn't that far down the list no. that they got him at 54. Zade Wisdom wasn't that far down the list that they got him at 94. That like, might be a steal some, of the draft type Right. Like, you got some pick. steals here. And Zade Wisdom has the potential to be a steal of the draft type of pick. And like, and like I said, some of the guides that I was reading through and stuff like that, Connor McLennan in the sixth round was a top 100 for some people. Sitting here again, Sunday, October 11th, right? A lot's happened in the past week. Right. Do you think the Philadelphia Flyers organization is in better shape than they were seven days ago when we recorded this show? Currently, no nah. future, future. Yes, because yeah. future, future wise, I think they very much looked at everything. And, and I, let's this way. It, Andre it, was the only defenseman they selected. By well, Andre was the only defenseman they selected, but it's not lost on me that they selected a kid who scored 36 goals last year, a kid who scored 29 goals last year, and a kid who scored 21 goals last year. The team knew what they were. Chuck Fletcher came in with a plan. Well, they knew that if they were going to be able to find a guy who has some goal, goal scoring touch, go they were for taking him. him. Yep. And, and let's put it this way. Who's to say, like we just said, Denoye had what what we say his number was 11 last year or something Something like that on the best, on the best junior team in hockey. So for Halifax, if he goes out and scores 25 this year, it's not doubles his total. Yeah. Then all of a sudden are we looking again and going, Oh, wait a minute. They, they drafted four guys who are offensive production guys for their junior teams. And that's exactly what this fan base wants. And I think it's exactly what the team needs. I know, by the way, Emil Andre scoring 11 goals at the Swedish junior level as an offensive-minded defenseman. As a defenseman, right. You know, gee, if he only starts putting up five goals at the Swedish elite level where goal goal scoring is at a complete premium because Oscar Lindblom, the best goal scorer in the league four years ago or whatever it was, scored 22, and we were going nuts over that because he's in the Swedish league where the ice absurd. is way bigger right. and, and everybody can just play perimeter all the time. He was scoring goals at that clip. Right. You know, we were excited about that, so... If you like, if that's why I said, if this defenseman goes out and scores anywhere between five and ten goals in the Swedish elite league, we're very, very holy happy. crap, they're going to go nuts over his offensive ability, too. And you know what? We will see those games as they develop. That season has, you know, begun. They're playing games, they're getting into it. And I'll uh, tell you what, the longer, the longer this may go, especially since we're, we're tentatively hanging on to January, but the longer it goes, I may have to spring for that uh, package that lets you watch the junior games. I might too. I mean, well, <laughs> it's, a sh- it's a shame because I don't think I'm going to do it over one guy they just drafted in the queue. But right. well, but when the W, but well, we're not the WHL because I don't even know if, what McLennan's the only one who's in the WHL. I think the other, you know, the other two are in the OHL and pl- will play against each other some nights. Right. Well, you, you can just get that and uh, charge it to your sports talk Philly expense account, right? 
Yeah, sure. Well, and on that note, I'm uh, I'm gonna throw the plugs out here. Make sure to follow one, the one, show. Wait, on one Twitter. more note. One more note. Go ahead, you, go ahead. you told me not to let you forget this when we did. The oh, show. you're right. You're right. Okay. You're Justin right. I know Williams. exactly what you're gonna say. Justin Williams. Before we really get quick. out of here, <laughs> the you would think family would like to set, to send the most sincere, honest congratulations to Justin Williams on an absolutely incredible career. He hung it up last week. Yeah. After two decades in the game, basically. And Mr. Game Seven. Do By I have the to way, say the video, that? the video they posted with it for Mr. Game Seven, the Man. very first clip is his first Game Seven where he scored his first playoff goal as a flyer yep. against Toronto that in 03. And man, Justin Williams, you are a true legend of the game. I'm not sure if you're going to be a Hall of Famer, but if I had a vote, I'm sure putting your name on the ballot. I'm going to go out on a limb and tell you he's going to make the Hall of Fame. Okay. Well, because good. because too many people have too much respect for him and what he's done over the course of years and how clutch he was and how otherwise just overall offensively gifted he was at times and and defensively gifted he was a good two way player let's phenomenal not phenomenal player his whole and, career and you know I, I'm not going to tell you I didn't have a hunch that this could be like it, that was not a surprising retirement announcement like unlike the other one we were talking about earlier in the show with Niskanen because he kind of he came back managed to you know what what did he play maybe 10 games total before the pause happened and then after that it was you know was with them for this playoff run and it wasn't a short playoff run by any no. stretch i mean i know that they were outmatched by boston in the second round or the first round but that qualifier was a clean sweep for them and they were looking really good there, there, were, there were a lot of us we were sitting there saying at that time i don't know if we you know i don't know if anybody wants to play carolina with the way they just no. won that series against the rangers but you know boston had another thing for them so yeah, but, and, and but we've always, I mean, we've always had a mad amount of respect for Justin Williams and just the absolutely. way he goes out and plays the game and he played it right. And and we mentioned we, we talked about we talked Niskanen about life after earlier. hockey. Yeah, I was about to say we mentioned it with Niskin and earlier. Justin Williams is another guy who can skate yeah, directly that, into whatever front office he wants. He is going to either be a scout or a coach. It probably no with Car- he probably with to, Carolina. He he is going to get hired by Carolina in one way or the other. But almost definitely. Well. Either way, Justin Williams, we would like to wish you well here at the You Would Think family. Please enjoy your retirement before you get a job in a front office. Spend some time with your family. Right. And, ob- and obviously, it's not like he hadn't done what every player sets out to do, which is win a Stanley Cup. He, did it, three, he did it three times over. Absolutely. Mr. Game so. 7 will live in hockey history. And, and, and by the way, another you know another check mark on the uh, list of credentials that you sit there and you go, that's what should put you in the Hall of Fame. You won three Stanley Cups. Absolutely. You and know, he was a big part he, of all of them. Well, exactly. Make sure to make sure to follow us on Twitter to hear us wax poetically more about Justin Williams. Uh, we're <laughs> at YWT Podcast. You can also find Kevin at Kevin underscore Darso. He's also over there at Sports Talk PHL and at Flyer Delphia during games and stuff. Uh, you can find the show everywhere: Facebook, iTunes, Podbean, uh, everywhere. Make sure to leave us a review. You know, we haven't asked for reviews in a while. Uh, if you listen on iTunes, go into the App Store and leave us a review. That would be fantastic. Uh, you can also find the show on sportstalkphilly.com every week. And uh, until then, I believe that's going to do it. Uh, I'm going to leave less... you. I'm going to leave everybody with one more thing really quick because I, okay. really brow- I haven't really browsed Twitter during the show. So okay. for news that happened while we recorded, Radic Faxa re-signed with Dallas. He was an RFA, I believe, so he re-signed. Um, but no, it's it a significant enough deal. It was five years, 3.25 per. Okay, that's a good little the, deal for but Radic the, but, the, but here's here's something I'm just show- – here's something I'm hearing. And this is, this is interesting. There are Taylor Hall to Nashville rumors. <sighs> now, and now here's the thing. No, no, and here, here's the thing. Why is that significant? It, it's significant for one reason, not necessarily for the player to the team. I have seen four different names. I've seen Mike Hoffman's name. I have seen uh, Tyler to name. I believe that there's a couple others out there. I'm trying to see if I can't find those really fast. But there's a handful of names forward wise who have basically said, I'm waiting for Hall and then I'm going to go in and then I'll be able to make a my lot of decision. dominoes are going to fall. Uh, OK, so Granlin and Hall are waiting. Mike Hoffman and Toffoli are waiting. Like these are all guys who are on the free agent market as forwards. So once Taylor Hall signs, there's going to be a domino effect. Absolutely. And it is like I am hearing that this is a like. You know, maybe there's something to it. Bottom line is whenever Taylor Hall signs, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next week. Yep. Whenever he signs, that's when you're going to get ready for the run on forwards to go. 
Absolutely. They're waiting for the big fish to go. And yep. that's when that's when everything is going to start to fall into place. So if you're waiting for the Flyers to do something potentially with a forward, that's know that a lot be. of the forwards, yep. know that the, a lot of the forwards out there are waiting for Taylor Hall to go somewhere. Yep. And then we'll start to go into play with things here. Cause it's not like there's a lack of interest from a lot of teams on a lot of these players. So yep. And again, make sure, to, make sure to follow us on Twitter. So when those dominoes do start falling, we'll be covering it at YWC Podcast, at Kevin underscore Carousel. And uh, unless the Flyers do something absolutely massive, we will be back in two weeks. And on that note, we'll see you guys later.